Hello, family. Hello. So good to be here with you today. I don't know if you notice this or not, but every time I come here, I don't come here too often, there's this sense of newness. I just feel like every time I come, this church is becoming newer, fresher. I don't know if it's the pictures today, but the walls are so clean. I'm having a hard time orienting myself because this is not the place that I'm so used to uh, uh, coming to. Uh, but so glad to be here. Uh, the church is still going through the series on Psalms, right? So anybody remember the last time I was here? That was about, I, I don't expect you to remember, but it was April 7th. But that was a long time ago. And uh, I uh, came to speak on six disciplines of righteousness. Um, if you remember some of the messages that I preached, I realized that as we have been going through this book of Psalm, that one of the themes that emerges from this book is really about righteousness. I don't know if this is something that you think about every day. In fact, I think the whole Bible, I think one of the most important topics that oftentimes we neglect is this concept of righteousness. Amen. That God wants us to, first of all, through Christ, we are righteous. God made us righteous, but God also wants us to grow into the full righteousness of Christ. And this is really the goal and the vision that God has for each one of us. So that's something that I've been really wrestling with as we were looking at some of these Psalms. And today we're going to read Psalm 139. And again, when you read a chapter like this, you're not going to think about righteousness. There's actually not a lot that actually speaks of righteousness. But uh, this is sort of the sequel from Psalm 37 that I spoke on. And uh, if we are really growing in our righteousness through Christ, how do we know? When you think about your life, five years ago or ten years ago, where you were and where you are today, what will be the signs of our growing in Christ's righteousness? Uh, if you're growing physical, you at least have a way of measuring your growth, right? Your weight or your height, there's a way. But is there a way for us to know whether we are actually growing in our righteousness? Uh, that's the topic that I want to talk about. And strangely, strangely enough, it actually comes from this very famous psalm. Psalm 139, if you actually type up, every psalm that I preached in the last six months is what's known as the most famous or the most beloved psalms, like 23, chapter 1, uh, 139 is one of them. Today I spoke uh, in San Jose uh, on another psalm that is supposed to be one of the most favorite psalms, 84. But I realized that we have the gift of reading things selectively. So we pick out a verse from here, we pick out a verse from there, and then we form our theology based on those partial readings. So today, we're going to practice. This might sound a little bit tedious, but we're going to read the entire chapter, which is about 24 verses. So it's going to take a little bit of time, but let's go ahead and read from 1 through 24, and then I am going to intentionally leave out the part that we think we know. We always use whenever we come to this psalm, and then I'll use the other verses to really form our theology about who God is and God's righteousness. So let's go ahead and read from 139, verse 1 through 24, okay? Ready? Let's go. Thank you. 
Amen. If you're like me, uh, you may find it really difficult to find the theme of righteousness in this, maybe in the latter part. And especially, like, if you think about this famous psalm, the part that we love is the middle part, starting from verse 12. You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. And I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That's our favorite part, right? That's the part that everybody loves. But let's go through this uh, chap- uh, chapter, this whole song. I would call the whole entire book of Psalm actually as the songs of the righteous. So many themes that occur and repeat over and over again is the difference between the righteous and the wicked. So even as we go through this, I want you to really think about where you are in terms of your growth journey in your own righteousness. Number one, the first sign of us growing in God's righteousness is that we grow in freedom for our, from our false self. Now this, again, you're probably puzzled, like where am I getting this? I'm, if I can just put it another way, I didn't have a time to edit this uh, slide, but if I can maybe phrase this in another way, if we are truly growing in our righteousness, another way to put this is that we grow in our awareness of our true self. Now, let me explain this to you. Uh, All of us, to a certain extent, we wrestle with two selves in us. That sounds really mental, right? Almost schizophrenic. There there are two me's inside of me. Uh, But that's actually what God is trying to teach us, and that's what uh, Psalmist is declaring. On the surface, if you read the psalm, Uh, you're going to just think that this is all about God's omniscience. Uh, God is all-knowing. And and the latter part is all about God's omnipresence. And then the last three verses or so is really about God's justice. And that's how most scholars will actually break down this psalm into those three parts. But there's something that is very, very personal here. When David says, he's not just declaring that God knows all things, but His testimony is that God knows me in a way that nobody knows. There's something, this is almost testimonial in a sense that all of us, in a sense, we have deep desire to be known, right? If nobody knows who you are, that's the saddest reality. That's that's the most tragic thing in this life. We all want to be known by our friends, our church people, our leaders, our, the ones that we love. And that is a deep core longing of our human desire. And yet, who really knows us like God? Here he's saying that you really, really know who I am inside. Um, I don't know how many of you have dabbled into the whole concept of artificial intelligence. Anybody have tried AI? Uh, Alliance leaders right now, we're actually researching uh, how AI will actually uh, help our ministries, but also how it will actually harm us, especially, you know, we're the stewards of God's truth. So how do we know that what AI or these technologies are giving us or feeding us is really the truth? So we're, we're trying to really understand this technology. And uh, so I've been kind of playing around with it. And just for fun, uh, we were actually testing out one of the AI platforms, and I typed in, write a country song about Ted Kang, a pastor of San Jose Christian Alliance Church. And uh, I was shocked when AI, it took about three minutes or 30 seconds to spit out a beautiful country song about Ted Kang. And I thought about sharing the song with you, but I'm a little too insecure uh, to talk about myself. So I actually typed in Pastor Douglas Dew, pastor of New Vine Community Church, and uh, I was blown away. Do you want to hear that song? I'm going to share the song with you. So here's the country song. The title of the song is Pastor Doug Tim. Uh, I don't, hope we have time, but I'll go from verse one, uh, three verses or bridge and chorus. Down in the heart where the new vines grow, there, there is a shepherd named Douglas Dew. This you got to know. With a spirit kind and a vision clear, he's planting hope and casting out fear. Verse 2, with every sermon, with every prayer, he teaches love and how to care. In the garden of life, he sows the seed. For kindness and compassion, he takes the lead. And then here's a bridge. 
It says, in the quiet town, under the open sky, his words are wings on which we fly. A preacher, a friend, in times of need, for every lost soul, he is there to lead. Pastor Doug, in the light of grace, finds the goodness in every face. At the New Vine community, he stands, holding hope in his welcoming hands. Verse 3, from dawn till dusk, in the fading light, he's there to guide them through the night. A shepherd true with a heart so vast, leading his flock towards peace at last. Here's outro. We're almost done. So there's, here's to Pastor Doug, a man so divine, nurturing love in every vine. A country song for a pastor so true. In the heart of the community, his faith anew. With Pastor Doug, no one walks alone. In his church, love has grown. A melody of faith, hope, and love, blessed by the stars above. You cannot see it, but he's blushing right now. His face is like orange red. <clears throat> now, the question is, how in the world AI figured out who Pastor Douglas is? That's the question. Do you think AI really knows Pastor Doug? As beautiful as this song is, I don't think that this is the knowledge that the psalmist is actually talking about. Is this just a kind of a collection of information that is out there that somehow the technology is able to aggregate all those things and can put together into a song, but we can never say that the computer or technology or whatever engine that is behind really knows Pastor Doc. Some of you may know this, but in San Jose Church, uh, Pastor Douglas is known as my ministry wife. He and I are, are wired so differently. We're gifted in such different ways that I make a lot of mess, and I'm not really into details. So Pastor Doug is oftentimes the one who kind of cleans up my mess. So uh, I've known him for almost 22 years now uh, since, since we came here, so it's been a long time, almost as long as I've known my wife. And out of all the staff that I work with, I think I probably know him the best. Amen. But what I know about Douglas is just a tip of an iceberg. Even with 22 years of relationship, probably the only person who knows Douglas more is probably his parents or, I would say, Cheryl. So if you really want to know what Douglas is like, Ask Cheryl. But uh, that's the knowledge that we're talking about here. It went here it says verse 1 through 4. You can just uh, uh, put that up there. You really know me better than I know myself. That's what David is actually declaring here. You know my thoughts. You know my intentions. You know my motives. You know the darkest secret. And then this is what he's declaring that yet you still love me. You still hem me in. You still lay your hand and you still consider me as one of your own. And he's declaring that such a knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. The thought that somebody knows me can be a great thing. It can also be a scary thing. Because once again, there are two selves, two different selves that we actually uh, carry in us. The reason why that idea of somebody knowing us so deeply can be terrifying is that because we all have a part of our being that we don't want anybody to know or see. Sometimes we call this shame. Sometimes we call this secret part of our being. All of us, to one degree or another, uh, we have built this, what we call an image of ourselves. This is the self that we want other people to know. Dr. Ted King or the Pastor Ted King or our accomplishment or what we've done, what we've earned, the things that will give us the respect and love in this world. That's the part that we want people to know. And yet, if somebody were to truly know what we are made of inside, that would be a terrifying thing. So, to cover up this true self that we struggle with, we create this public image. Oftentimes, we can call that a false self. For those of you who went through Empower, uh, David uh, uh, Benner wrote a book. It's a, really a powerful book called The, the Gift of Being Yourself. 
in this, this is what he calls it. He calls this self or public image that we create, he calls it false self or pretend self. This is really more of what I would call a public or visible self. And for some of us, we actually convince ourselves that this preset, pretend self is all of our true self. This is what we call a lack of self-awareness. That we think that this is who I am, and people see it, everybody knows it, but I am in denial. But he, David Benner, makes this powerful quote. I want to share this. He says, the self that God persistently loves is not my pretty up or pretend self, but it's my actual self. So unless we begin to die to our self, this false self or visible self, and learn to imp- embrace our true self, meaning that we become brutally honest with our own brokenness and our own darkness, we will never experience this freedom that David is talking about in Psalm 139. In fact, the healthiest, the sign of our growing in our righteousness is that our true self and our public self become just one. That's what we call congruence. That's what we call character. We're so concerned about how people would perceive us in public. Uh, You hear me preach here, so you have certain assumptions about who I am, but many of you do not know how I behave and how I treat my wife or how I treat my children until you come into my home and you see me as I am. And when those two people become one or two selves become one, that's what we call congruence, and that's one of the key signs of our righteousness. And David is really declaring that, Lord, you know everything about me. There's nothing hidden about my soul. You know me better than I know myself. You know that before I even speak a word, you know what's going to come out of my mouth. And yet, you still embrace me. You still love me. This is freedom. If you can get there. And if we can grow into that kind of freedom, then we become, we become more like Christ in our righteousness. Some of you know my testimony. I, I have a pretty messed up childhood and traumatic childhood. I did not have a very normal family life. Uh, three fathers, uh, I mean, three, uh, my father had three marriages, three families. And I grew up with this deep sense of shame and abandonment. And I was even labeled as the one that broke up my parents' marriage. So I had this deep shame, and all throughout my life, I could be gracious to other people. I wanted to be known as a nice guy so that nobody can reject me. But I was so harsh on myself. I became, all throughout my young uh, adulthood, I became almost obsessive, perfectionistic performer. That I had to be so good at everything that I do, whether it's school, whether it's hobbies, or, or uh, whatever I do, that I wanted to be the best at what I do, but that became a slavery in my life. No matter how good I become or what I do, I could never be gracious to myself. And so one day I was really struggling. I was literally looking at my, in the, into the mirror, so disappointed in myself, because I was looking into my deep, hidden soul. And the Holy Spirit really spoke to me, confronted me. That, Ted, you're so concerned about looking good than being good. You're more worried about looking righteous than being righteous. And then he began to really speak into my soul that the person that I love is just who you are at the core. It doesn't matter how broken you are. Until you come to embrace that self, then you'll never be free. Now, this sounds like some, one of those kind of a spiritual break. It is. But, you know, what is scary is that this is later in my ministry, meaning that this happened actually in the last decade, meaning that all throughout my ministry life ever, as a pastor, I was trying so hard to present myself with this image of being a good guy, being a righteous guy, being like Christ while struggling. And, in, in fact, my inside world was crumbling. And it wasn't until I I was able to embrace myself that I really began to grow in my maturity. So that's really the first lesson or first sign of us growing in God's righteousness. The second thing that David talks about here is that we also grow in our awareness of God's 
presence. Now, I'm going to share this another quote from a man named Richard Rohr, and I could get in trouble for doing this because uh, he is a pretty controversial writer, and some of the things that he's written is consider universalism, uh, but I think he's done a lot of profound work in spiritual formation. So I'm going to share this with a grain of salt, uh, but listen to what he says here. He says, we cannot attain the presence of God. We are already totally in the presence of God. What's absent is our awareness. I want you to imagine for a moment after the service that I, I will follow to your home, your work. I'll be in your life, in your face for the next 24-7, seven days, just for one week. I'll eat with you. I'll, when you go to sleep, I'll lie next to your bed, and I'll just watch <laughs> over you. I'll be present in your life for the next seven days, 24 hours. How would you feel? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I, would you really welcome me into your home or in, into your life? Now, here's, here's a challenge. The presence of God, the concept of God's presence is so misunderstood in the church that we oftentimes, we sing about inviting God's presence or entering into God's presence. And I think there's a level of certain truth, but I think our theology is oftentimes shaped by the songs that we sing or the phrases that people say. It is actually a very unbiblical concept because, number one, God does not need our invitation to be present anywhere in this world. He's already present. That's what Richard Rohr is saying. Whether we know it or not, God's presence is everywhere. Secondly, there's no place in the universe that is outside of God's presence. So when we talk about this presence, God, David is declaring that when I go to North, you're there. When I go to this place, you're there. There's nowhere in the universe that I can escape your presence. That's what he's declaring. It's not just a theological or doctrinal knowledge. That in his life, he learned that God is literally in every part of his reality. And God does not need our invitation. This is re really what we're talking about is God's rule and reign. Yes, there's, there are times that God will manifest his glory. God will manifest his presence. And he will invite us into his manifest presence and glory. But that is very different from us thinking that we can invite God in and out of our lives. That is actually a very weak theology. Here's a problem. That in our doctrine, we know that God is present everywhere. But very few people live with awareness of His presence. In other words, very few people Live as if God is present at all times. Now, you do not like the idea of me being in your life 24-7, right? What if, instead of just being in your face constantly for the next 24 hours, 7 days, that I just install a surveillance camera in every part of your life, in your room, in your workplace, in your bedroom, right over your bed, that I'll just install a surveillance camera and I'll watch you every moment of your life. Would you like that? <laughs> that is a picture of God's presence. How many of you live as if God is watching at all times? There's no reality. There's nothing in your life that will be ever hidden from His sight. The difference between the righteous and wicked is that the righteous people grow in their awareness of God's presence. They live their lives as if God is watching every moment of your life. Whereas the wicked people, what the Bible actually calls wicked, they live in total ignorance or denial of God being in your life or that God would even care about your life. That's the difference. Practicing the presence of God is really what the Bible would call the fear of the Lord. 
if we truly live with the sense that every part of my life is actually exposed and God sees it, God knows it all, then the outcome of our lives will be actually very, very different. That's what the Bible actually calls fear of the Lord, and that's really the beginning of all wisdom. That your outcome of your life will be radically different if we learn to with that awareness. When we are tempted to cheat or to lie or to make choices that we know will grieve God's heart, being mindful, being aware of God's presence all around us is oftentimes what will prevent us from making those choices. That is how we grow in our righteousness. And this awareness that we're talking about, this awareness that David is talking about, you're everywhere, I cannot escape your presence, it only comes from the practice of daily walking with God when nobody's watching. I'm not just talking about when we come to church then it's easy for us to just project our image or our, our other self. But when you're alone, when you go home, and when nobody's watching, how you behave, what comes out of your mind and what comes out of your thought is really your true self. And that if you can train your mind to really understand that God is there, I will even go one step further. I, I'm, I'm practicing this, but you know, this has really helped me. The Bible doesn't just talk about the presence of God. There's in Hebrews chapter 12, but there's another picture that can be terrifying for some of us. Now, there's this one verse that says that there's a cloud of witnesses that are cheering for us. Now, the question is, is it 24-7 or when we are only winning or doing well? When do you think they're watching us and cheering for us that we will finish our race? It's not just when we are doing well. I think there's a reality that we do not understand, that it's not just God who's watching us, but there's a cloud of witnesses that are also participating and cheering for us, watching us, so that we will finish the race well, and that all of us at one point will have to give an account of our life before the Lord. And so if we live that with that, that mindset, once again, think about how different, how radically different our lives will be if we live with that awareness. I'm going to have to speed up a little bit. Here's a third point. How do we know that if we're growing in righteousness, we grow in our hatred towards evil? Or another way to put it is we also grow in our hunger for God's righteousness. Now, that sounds a little bit paradoxical because if we grow in our righteousness for God or righteousness of God, we grow in our hunger for more of God's righteousness. Yes, exactly. And another way to look at it is that we also grow in our hatred towards evil. Verse 19 through 21, can, do we have that? Can we just read that last part? 19. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty, they speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you. Now, this is a little bit problematic. Uh, it's controversial because it doesn't really belong to the rest of the chapter. If you put everything together, it seems like this is like where is this really coming from? David is talking about how wonderfully and fearfully made he's made. That how God has put together his inmost being and then he's praising him and all of a sudden he's saying that I hate not only evil around the world, but I hate the wicked people. I hate evildoers. It sounds like, if you just read on, it sounds like David is also accusing God of overlooking injustice. Or he, it sounds like he's complaining about God's enemies, that how God actually just overlooks the evil or the evildoers. That's why some scholars will say that this was either a later edition or it's just it's not what David actually wrote as part of this chapter. Some will call this imprecatory psalm, me meaning that uh, you're imprecating or you're asking God to bring vengeance upon evildoers. But I want you to listen carefully what David is saying. He says, do I not hate those who hate you, Lord? 
and abhor those who are in rebellion against you. I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. That's a pretty strong language there. But I don't believe that what David is saying here is accusatory or complaining. And also, David is not just calling for personal vengeance against those people who chase after him. There are a lot of those Psalms throughout the book of Psalms, but this is not one of them. What he's saying instead here is that I hate those hate, those who hate you. I hate those people who have no regard for your name. Your enemies are now my enemies. It is no longer about David's personal safety or his personal welfare. We all have a level of hatred towards those people who hate us. It's just kind of reciprocal. But here, David has no reason to be so angry. It's almost contradictory to one of those six disciplines that we talked about, right? Turn away from wrath. We have to learn how to turn away from our wrath. But if you remember... Being angry or having anger is part of God's image in all of us. If you don't get angry with injustice, there's something wrong. There's a brokenness in all of us. See, what David is declaring here is also very, very relevant. We live in a cultural moment where tolerance has become one of the highest virtues. Talk to young people. I have this conversation with our girls all the time over our dinner table. Anytime that you mention the word hatred, you're already labeled as a narrow-minded religious bigot. You cannot talk about righteous and wicked. It all depends on your perspective or where you're looking at it from. That's what our culture actually teaches us in this moment. And so... What David is saying here, if we were to use those same language and we would actually use it in our conversation, immediately you're going to be labeled, you're going to be ostracized as one of those hypocritical religious zealots. We're used to hearing statements like, God hates sin but loves sinners. Is that really true? Again, that sounds wonderful, um, and it sounds culturally appropriate, politically correct. But is that what the Bible actually teaches us? If you read places like Psalm 5, it it explicitly says that God hates all who do iniquity. As we go through this theme of righteousness and wicked, he says over and over again that God will destroy the wicked. Now, if you think that God only hates sin of the people and loves the sinners, how can that same God create a place called hell where all the sinners, all the wicked people will be actually sent into? God has compassion. God has mercy. God is gracious. God still yearns for the sinners to return to him. And that's why he sent his son Jesus Christ into this world. And that's why we need to preach this gospel. To hold that to ourselves is probably one of the greatest selfishness uh, that God will also hold us accountable to. And yet, there's no concept anywhere in the Bible where that God will overlook sin or wickedness in this world. There is a time of judgment, and that is part of the gospel that we must preach. The question is that instead of talking about the world and the sinners, I want us to really ask ourselves, has there been a sign of us growing in our hatred towards evil? Anything that is unjust. What God is saying and what the psalmist is really declaring is that God's people cannot be neutral towards evil. The true sign of us growing in righteousness is that we also grow in our hatred towards anything that stands against God's righteousness. I believe that we are where we are today. Christianity is under scrutiny because we made it all about our personal welfare and our happiness and our prosperity over the righteousness of God, over justice. So our rhetoric in the church is just more of a rhetoric. That's what it is. The people do not really show the sign of true righteousness being lived out by Christians in this world. 
Look carefully how David ends this lament. And that's how we're going to end this uh, study. If Psalm 139 ended with verse 22, it would really lead us to some form of self-righteousness. But all his anger that he expresses in these few verses actually eventually turns inward. And this is how he ends this psalm. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. Here's a statement that really shows what it means to grow in our righteousness. It's a posture of humility. It's a posture of inward look that we're constantly examining how we are living our lives. And all that hatred towards evil and injustice has to first come from within ourselves. This is really the ultimate sign of our righteousness. So uh, it's really appropriate that we come to this wonderful table of the Lord today. I want you to really take a moment. Because as we take this bread and as we drink from this cup, once again, it probably highlights one of the most beautiful metaphor or beautiful reality of what it means to be God's people is that we are in union. We live in union with Christ. That when we take that bread, I explained this to our San Jose people, the commun- in the alliance, communion is sacramental, meaning that it's a means of grace. It's a way for us to experience God's grace, His forgiveness, His healing. There's something that will happen as we partake in this. But before we do that, let us examine ourselves. Take a moment. Whether you are struggling, uh, trying to build this false self or pretend self, or even in this moment, are you really able to embrace your true self that only God sees and knows? And are you able to embrace that self and come before the Lord as we partake in this communion? How aware are you of God's presence in your life, His activity in your life? It's a little easier in the church because we feel like God's presence is stronger here. It is no longer stronger here in this room than when you walk outside or when you go back to your house, when you go to your, your home, your workplace, when you're playing pickleball in your court. I've been playing pickleball lately. Wherever you are, we represent Christ and God's presence is there. Uh, the last thing that I want you to really think about is Do you sense in yourself there's this growth or growing in your hatred towards evil or injustice? Or another way to put it is, are you hungering for God's righteousness? Do you care about what goes on around us? What is happening in the lives of people? Ask the Lord to search your heart. Catch your anxious thoughts. Let's come before the table And let's enter into this great gift that God made available to us, that is to enter into union with Christ as we eat this bread and as we drink from his cup. Jesus, we know that you are here, and we thank you, Lord, for your presence today. Father, we pray, Lord, that these words that we have just sung would not be mere words or even lies, But Jesus, we pray that we would really desire for you. That Jesus, you would be all that we want. You would be all that we desire. Lord, it would not be the pursuit of things in this life. It would not be pursuit of things materially or even pursuit of things financially or academically. But Jesus, that you would draw us near to you that in fact, God, we would desire for righteousness sake, that we would desire to be righteous people, that we would hate evil, that we would desire to be in your presence, that we would desire for your kingdom to be here. Jesus, that we would desire for more of you each day. So Father, we thank you for that reminder, for that invitation, that Jesus, 
we want to be drawn closer to you, that we, all we want is you and your righteousness. God, forgive us if that is not our desire. Father, we pray that you would realign our desires with your desires to want only you, to in fact seek after righteousness each day. So Father, we ask God that you would come now, Holy Spirit, that you would clothe us with your righteousness, not because of anything that we could ever do, but because you declare us righteous and that we would live righteous lives each day, that from the youngest to the oldest here at New Vine, that God, you would clothe us with your righteousness, with those right robes of righteousness for the saints. Father, we receive your robes, we receive your righteousness, and we ask, God, that you would cause us to live righteous and holy lives for your glory and for your sake. Jesus, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you, Jesus, for your presence here now. For we ask this all in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. Amen.